What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and today I'm going to be ranking Jack Bruce's solo albums, just the ones that are like Jack Bruce by himself, um, 14 of them, um, in order of my favorite. Um, that's it. That's the criteria, how much I like them. Um, Jack Bruce, um, most famously of Cream, right? Uh, the Zappa connection is he jammed with Zappa on apostrophe, the song, which is on the album, apostrophe. Um, plus there's other versions of that jam on uh, Crux of the Biscuit. Um, so that is the direct Zappa connection. Um, yeah, I love Jack Bruce. Um, I think uh, one, of the, one of the words I've seen thrown around in describing his career is journeyman. Uh, which I don't really think applies to him, though he has played with a lot of different musicians in a lot of different contexts. So I guess he technically qualifies, but he seems more of a, a solo artist who just happens to play with a lot of people, um, especially because like when he's in a group, he's not like the bass player in the group. He's like, this is Jack Bruce's group and he's playing bass. It's a difference. Um, but anyways, um, when I think of journeyman musicians, I think of like usually there's a point in their career where they're not really breaking new ground or doing anything they haven't already done. And maybe they're, like in the case of Jack Bruce, in the case of Eric Clapton, I think is another good example of his late career stuff. They're, they definitely sound like the era they're in, like the production, you know, they're still like kind of trying to adapt to the ways, but their songwriting isn't really going any place. And what really makes those albums special is like, how well you connect to that musician. Like for Jack Bruce, he's always got his voice, he's always got his bass playing. And those two things are gonna take a Jack Bruce album and elevate it to a certain level regardless. And I think at some point in the 80s, he becomes a journeyman musician where like, we're not really breaking a new ground or we're even covering a lot of old ground. Um, I'll get to that very shortly. Um, and so it kind of, it is a weird term that I think kind of describes some of his later albums, um, though I think his early 70s stuff is a solo artist visionary type thing. Um, not necessarily a journeyman. I don't know why I went into that, but it's a it's a word I've seen thrown around describing him a lot. And I, I'm kind of weird about it, though I do agree some of his later albums have that feel. Um, but um, what else was I going to say? Oh, he does something really interesting. And I, I'll, I'll try to point out which ones he does, if I remember. Um, but uh, he covers his material a lot. Like songs he's already released. He like in later incarnations, either of him as a solo artist, whether he's doing something on Strictly Piano or whether it's just a different band, he's revisiting a bunch of old an old songs and kind of not dramatically reworking them, kind of staying true to them, but just the instrumentation is different, so it feels different. Um, and then he does that with a handful of Cream songs on a couple albums too that miraculously somehow work, at least to these years they do. So he does have that habit of like recycling material, which makes listening to his later stuff interesting because um, there's always like something in there that like, oh yeah, I know this from like, that's that album, I like this. So there's that weird thing about Jack that he does. But anyways, that's it, 14 albums. I'm gonna start with number 14 and go to number one. That's it, on to number 14. Number 14 is his eighth studio album, Automatic. Uh, this came out in 83, and it's an 83 album. He's the only musician on it. He plays bass, he plays keyboards, and he plays a whole bunch of synthesizers, particularly the Fairlight CMI, which I think uh, Peter Gabriel most famously used on his a couple of his early 80s albums to much better effect than Jack Bruce uses them. Um, I think it just sounds like a drum machine for some of this stuff. It very much sounds like the 80s. Um, there are a handful of good songs on here. I think the opening Make Love is really good, especially his vocal performance on this is really strong. This is a song he would uh, re-record. It's called Make Love Part Two on the next album, which wouldn't come out for six years, at least as a solo Jack Bruce album, uh, Make Love Without the Part Two is on it. Um, then we get a bunch of stuff that just kind of is bland and kind of forgettable towards the side two, side B, green and blue kind of works. The Swarm has a really good golden earring twilight zone energy, kind of has that do -do 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 kind of energy, but it, in a more swarmier feel, uh, aka like the title. 
Um, and then Encore, uh, the penultimate song, kind of sounds like old school, early 70s, uh, maybe even 69, Jack Bruce, has a very kind of old school uh, sound that works. And so it's not a waste of an album. Uh, the horrible 80s sound, his use of the synthesizer, I don't think is as effective as the stuff Peter Gabriel was doing on uh, Security 4. Um, but uh, there's a handful of good songs. The first song, then you just kind of tread water for a while. And then the side B is kind of consistent and pretty good. Um, but yeah, um, I, it's one of those you go to after you've already experienced a whole bunch of other Jack Bruce. Don't start here. Don't start here. Um, but that's my number 14, Automatic. Number 13 is his seventh album. Um, uh, I've always wanted to do this. Not sure what it was he's always wanted to do is this is a pretty, I would say bland and kind of safe collection of just kind of Jack Bruce rock songs. Um, the band is really good. Um, Billy Cobham's on drums. Uh, David Sanchez is on keyboards. Clem Clemson's on guitar. Um, yeah, I can't go wrong with the band, but I don't know. It's just kind of generic, bland, kind of just rock. Um, yeah. Um, Hit and Run, the opening track, has kind of a good, maybe upbeat pop feel. Uh, then we get a bunch of songs that kind of don't do anything for me. Uh, Mickey the Fiddler is on here, which is from the previous album, uh, Jet Set Jewel, but it wasn't Jet Set Jewel. I don't believe was released, though, until much later i so it, it was it's from a song mickey the fiddler was on jet set jewel which was recorded in 78 but i don't believe it was released until much later than that um if i'm not mistaken but that's on here so we're already remaking songs but then again we're not really remaking them uh or they haven't been released um dancing on air uh one of the better tracks on here um living without you kind of upbeat fun um, and then the closing bird alone has some nice kind of jazzy proggy energy um, that works. But um, yeah, for the most part, it just kind of, um, I don't know, it's kind of, again, as the one I just talked about, 14, start strong, then kind of treads water for a while, then ends strong. Um, but for the most part, I think it just maybe sounds a little better and the songs are slightly more engaging than number 14. But I kind of rank those. Um, kind of at the same. But yeah, that's my number 13. Um, I've always wanted to do this. Uh, number 12 is Something Else. Um, this came out in 1993. It's his 10th. Um, 93, and we're still kind of dealing with some bad production issues, just some bad sounding, just cold studio type, that kind of overproduced type stuff. Um, and again, uh, well, this one's a little more consistent than the other two where the good songs are kind of sprinkled throughout. Um, but the other stuff is maybe just a little too, little too bland, um, but there are some good moments throughout here. Uh, the opening track, um, Waiting on a Word, has an Eric Clapton 70s laid back chill vibe. If I ever say that, that is a compliment. Huge fan of 70s Eric Clapton. Um, so that's a pretty good song. Um, the opening track, Waiting on a Word. Um, Ships in the Night is like a ballad, but it's very, very tasty guitar on it. And if I'm not mistaken, Clapton plays on this album, um, along with Clem Clepson and two other guitarists. I think Clapton's playing on Ships in the Night. Might be the only song he's on, um, but that's pretty good. Also, uh, both Walt Fowler, Walt Fowler and Bruce Fowler play on this. So there's another Zappa connection. Um, Pieces of East is a weird, all over the place, jazzy, funky, crazy number. But the drums sound, ugh, do not like that drum sound. Um, it's just this weird dated production. Um, again, we got some weird problem sounds with criminality, but criminality kind of works. as some nice uh, sort of Captain B fart crazy saxophone towards the end. Um, and then the closing FM um, is a, a nice piano uh, instrumental solo, a nice little closing piece where Jack sits down and plays a nice little piano piece. Um, so not definitely a little more consistent than the ones I just talked about. Uh, still dealing with some some bad production issues, I think, that just date it and not in a good way. Um, but there's enough good songs in here to keep your engagement. And uh, and again, he always got his voice and he always got his bass playing and those things are always working. Uh, but that is my number 12, Something Else.
Number 11 is a question of time, which was his, uh, I don't know what number this was. Um, this was his ninth, his ninth studio album. Um, I bought this in real time, or at least when it came out way back in 1989. Uh, so I might be ranking it maybe a little bit higher than it deserves. Um, he tries to get a little hard rocky on here, maybe even a little, not metal, but maybe leaning towards some shredding guitar that I personally don't think works. Just comes across as kind of generic hard rock. But I think the slower songs work really well. Again, his voice, his bass playing, all that stuff uh, kind of works. And again, there's nothing that's, I think, really bad, but we have some really good stuff kind of sprinkled throughout. Um, like the opening Life on Earth is just kind of a shred generic hard rocker that to me sounds very late 80s. Um, second song is that remake of Make Love from the album that came out in 83. Uh, love it. Love the melody on this. Love his performance on this. Um, he does a cover of Willie Nixon's Blues You Can't Lose, which really, really works. Um, I like this. Um, and interestingly enough, even though this came out in 89, like I don't think the sound production is as bad as the one that preceded it or the one that followed it. So there's this brief little time where he's not s completely dating himself uh, with the sound of his, uh, with the, the sound of the album. Oh, and Make Love has like a real like sort of like R&B smooth vibe about it. That's one of the things I like about it. Um, um, there's a good groove in the song called uh, Let Me Be. It has a nice, really good, like, Jack Bruce, one of those. Like, he doesn't get funky, but whatever he does, like, whatever those grooves are, funk is like a weird word, because I don't think he's a particularly funky player, but he makes you want to move, and he just lays down these, these grooves. Let Me Be is a good groove. Quella, kind of a little um, fa reggae that doesn't work for me. Um, and then the title track is kind of cool, kind of weird. as this nice, almost like marching type weird ending to it. A little bit of an eclectic song. Um, not a bad album. Uh, definitely rocking harder than some of his other stuff. But I think the ballads and the slower stuff, the mid-tempo stuff, work better than the, the hard rock and stuff, which just kind of comes across to me a little generic. I'm very dated of like late 80s type stuff. But yeah, there's some really good moments on here. And the list of people who are playing guitar... Um, is Jimmy Rip, uh, Vernon Reed, in, uh, not in Living Color, Living Color, Albert Collins, Vivian Campbell. Um, so we got some really, Paul Barrer, Barrer from Little Feet's playing Slide. Alan Holdsworth is on this. Um, so yeah, wow. I'm just remembering or realizing all these amazing people are on here. But I don't think it particularly, like, I don't think the song service the players and I don't think the guitar shredding is enough to, like, kind of lift this up. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it lands for me, uh, a question at a time, uh, number 11. Number 10 is his last album, his 14th studio album as a solo artist, Silver Rails. Um, and this is a pretty good, just a really solid, well-performed album. And I think its strength is kind of the, he's, every song kind of varies in just a little degree. And so we're getting like sort of, I don't know if they're like homages or tributes or you're just echoing the, the music of other bands. And I feel a lot of other bands in this, but in like the best way possible. Um, Reach for the Night, the second song has a very sort of, uh, has one of those, nighttime saxophones in the background that kind of works. Um, horrible comparison, but it reminds me of that Glenn Fry song that was big in the 80s that he used on Miami Vice that just had that solo. This is a much better version, a much better song than that. Uh, but that's sort of the feel. Also reminds me of kind of Your Latest Trick, the Dire Straits song, but that kind of like, it feels like a late night type song. Um, Rusty Lady uh, has a really good sort of like uh, Queen of the Stone Age type just groove to it. You could definitely see some queens uh, doing this song and dropping that song. Um, really good energy there. Um, Industrial Child is a nice, really sort of haunting solo, like ballad, uh, just a beautiful haunting type piece. Um, drone has a heavier vibe, um, not heavy in a sense of like, metal hard rock guitars but just everything's hitting harder the bass is deeper just the energy is just a little darker and just mm. there's a cover of uh keep it down from out of the storm what a fantastic song i think that's one of his great song to cover comes towards the end of the album and it's like yeah i can that's a groove right there keep it down um 
yeah, just a really good, solid last effort. Um, came out in 2014. Um, so what, when did it come out? It came out March 24th, and then when did he pass away? Not till October. So yeah, six months before he passed away, seven months before he passed away. So uh, great last effort, really good listen. Um, I do think this is, like it's very much, this is the journeyman. I think all of these albums are like the journeyman musician trying to find his way and kind of lost in a world where punk and everything and, and things are changing. This is a very confident, this is a, confident album from a confident artist great choice and cover um and just some really really good performances throughout yeah it's a good album um yeah and again the guest musicians on here phil manzanera is playing on the lead track robin trower's on here yeah john medeski's playing on here man he's always got some good guest musicians but the good thing about it is they don't over clutter or like other than i think the one i just talked about um they don't really over clutter it. You don't know that unless you look. Everybody's used really, really well. But this is a great, great final out, uh, effort. My number 10, Silver Rails. Number nine is his 11th studio album, Monk Jack. And this is Jack Bruce singing, Jack Bruce playing the piano, and then uh, Bernie Worrell uh, of the P-Funk universe on Hammond B3 organ. Uh, and that's it. And the Hammond B3 organ is used in sparingly and effectively and just always adding the perfect textures to a whole bunch of songs that are essentially Jack Bruce sitting down at a piano. Um, just great songs, um, some sort of remake of earlier songs. The Boy is on here, um, which is on one of his earlier albums, um, which I can't remember now which one The Boy is on. Uh, really good song. Um, the uh, What else do we have a cover of? We have a cover of Weird of Hermiston off Songs for a Taylor. Um, that's a really good choice. A cover of Folk Song off uh, Harmony Row. Um, so we got some really good selections to do solo piano. Um, the opening song, The Food, has some great lyrics about infidelity. Uh, not his infidelity. He's being cheated on, unfortunately. Poor guy. Um, but yeah, just a really, really good album. Um, he does a good job of mixing up. There's a couple instrumentals on here that are thrown in there. Um, towards the end, you get a longer song, Tightrope, which has a really nice jazzy sort of interlude instrumental part in it. Um, the closing in Moral Ninth is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, it's a really good balanced album of like him performing songs on piano, little jaunty instrumentals, some like bluesy instrumentals. Um, he, the palette, the flavors are like well mixed up, even though it really is just like mostly piano with some organ and his voice. But again, that's what it is, a piano and his voice. Um, so it, it works. It's a really good, satisfying album. It's one of those I like to listen to when I'm driving home somewhere late at night and I'm wide awake and just can focus on the music. But yeah, really good album. But that's my number nine, uh, Monk Jack. Uh, number eight is his first recorded album, but second officially released album, Things We Like. This is his jazz album, completely instrumental, uh, kind of like free jazz inspired. Um, apparently it's a bunch of songs he wrote when he was a preteen is what he claims. Um, but we have Jack Bruce on bass, double bass. Uh, we have Dick Hextel Smith on both soprano and tenor, and apparently he can play them both at the same time. So you have instances in which he's playing both saxophones at the same time. John Heisman on drums, and then John McLaughlin plays on uh, several of the tracks. I don't think he's on the first two, um, and he's shredding. He's bringing it, uh, even channeling some um, uh, Robert Fripp sort of beep, 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 kind of energy every once in a while. Um, but yeah. Just really good, fun, high energy, well played jazz album. You know, leaning more towards experimental free jazz and kind of open ideas. Um, yeah, just really good stuff. Like if you like jazz, and you don't need Jack Bruce to sing any songs and you like solos from a bunch of people and people going crazy and a saxophone just blowing all over the place. Yeah, it's a really good, just kind of bare bones, direct, everybody doing a great job like blue uh jazz album um five originals and then there's a cover there's a medley of two songs called sam sam enchanted dick uh, a milt jackson song called sam sack 
and then a, uh, a, a song that this saxophone player wrote uh, called Rills Thrills, and then there's a cover of Mel Torme's Born to be Blue. Um, other than that, it's a bunch of Jack Bruce originals, really good album, just sounds really good. Um, yeah, apparently the original mix of this, um, I don't have the original mix, but the drums were like on one side and it was a really unbalanced kind of weird listen, uh, but that I think has been fixed. So but if you can find the original, it's probably worth something maybe, I don't know, No, don't know these things, but yeah. Really good, good album. Uh, that's my number eight, right? My number eight, um, Things We Like, and I like this. Uh, number seven is How's Tricks. How's Tricks. Um, th this album is his fifth studio album, came out in 1977. Um, really, really good album. I like this album. This is just confident Jack Bruce um, playing sort of a, very 70s, clean sounding, just like, I don't know what, it's like, it's kind of rock, but there's like jazzy elements still, and it's still just Jack Bruce being Jack Bruce, but a whole bunch of just really, really good songs. Opens up with like sort of a, a song called Without a Word, which is a ballad that has this like really interesting sort of jazzy midsection before going back into the ballad. Definitely different energy, but kind of reminds me of My Morning Jacket's Evil Urges, which of course came decades later, but just having a song, this really nice interlude in the middle and then going back to the song. And when you go back into the song, it's kind of empowered by the interlude. Um, second song, um, Johnny 77. Well, that's not what it's called. I'm trying to remember these. Uh, Johnny B 77. Um, kind of, it's a high upbeat number. Kind of reminds me of uh, Mata Hoople. It's a couple tracks on here, which for some reason remind me of Mata Hoople. Like he doesn't sing like Mata Hoople and it's not, definitely there's no glam element to it, but there's a, the hard rockers have a Mata Hoople element, which to me is a good thing. That's a compliment. Um, times, really nice low key bass in the verses that is just absolutely awesome. Another sort of jazzy interlude in the middle, like soft, steely Danish type jazz. Baby Jane, uh, 70s type rocker, reminds me of Mata Hoople. Um, Lost Inside a Song it has a nice uh, sort of quiet, soft build to a nice heavier middle section that works really, really well. Um, the title track is this sort of reggae infused house tricks. House tricks. Again, Eric Clapton comparisons. Anytime he goes into that sort of like, almost like, get ready, get ready. We're, we're echoing some like... Uh, Eric Clapton type, those kind of get ready, William the Hand Jive, get ready type grooves. And that's okay. That's a great thing. Love it. But love the title track. Love just that house tricks. Just uh, feels so good. Um, Madhouse is kind of an all over the place, upbeat, fun, hot mess. Um, waiting for the call. I'm pretty particular with my blues workouts, you know, when bands go into the blues. This is a great blues workout. Uh, Jack Bruce knows what he's doing with the blues. Um, and then uh, another song called Out Outsiders, really kind of fast paced, almost slightly chaotic, uh, very jazzy rock. Um, yeah, almost every song on here has something to offer. Really good, really strong, really consistent. Um, yeah, really, really solid album. Uh, my number seven, How's Tricks? How's Tricks? Number six and number five. Uh, number six, more Jack than God. Number five, something in the air. I put these two, shadows in the air, sorry. I put these two together because they're both produced by someone named Kip Hanrahan. And they both kind of have the same exact refreshing, awesome vibe about them. Uh, first off, they both feature a lot of hand drums. Um, and the hand drums, like conga in particular, um, provides a completely different sort of flavor and element and vibe to everything on both these albums. Like, these albums sound like, they're definitely not loose ramshackle affairs, but they really sound like the band learned the songs, met in the studio, played them once or twice, and we released them. Like, there is a a freshness to these, there's a liveliness to them, there's an immediacy to them, um, and there's a fun to them. Like, both of these albums just sound amazing. Um, 
this uh, more Jack than God came out second. It's the second of the two. Um, I think it's not as as successful as the first one, and, and we'll get to why the first one um, in a second. Um, some great songs from start to finish, um, including some covers, as he's been doing. Um, what do we have here? We have a cover of I Feel Free, the Cream song. Uh, we have a cover of uh, Politician, the Cream song. Um, interesting covers. Um, I don't think they're as good as the covers that are on the, uh, the previous album, but just really, really good songs, really good vibe, some good lyrics. Everything fe just feels loose and free and everybody having a good time. It's just a really, 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 really good album. And that would be my number six. My number five, Shadows in the Air, which came out in 2001, the other one came out in 2003, has a whole bunch of covers, all of them either excellent choices or choices you're like, whoa, that should not work, but somehow it does. Um, there's a cover of Boston Ball Game 1967, which is essentially the same song. Like they're not, he's not rearranging it, but now we just have more stuff going on. And as it's building, we got more horns in the background and more percussion. It just like has this greater, just greater energy about it. Um, there's a cover of Sunshine of Your Love, which should not work, but does. Um, there's a cover of uh, He the Richmond off um, their, his debut album. And there's a cover of White Room on here. And it shouldn't work. But for some reason, it does. It starts off with, instead of like a dun, 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 dun it's more like dun, dun, like really low key. Dun, dun, dun. And then when we drop into the in a white room, it reminds me of Moe's plane crash in which you have that really big no, 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 like rip vamp or that riff. And then when they drop it in the vocals, it's like, Mama, you can just, you can hear, you can see the conga players in the background. This, this white room has that plane crash conga vibe and the Latin flavor that this get, it works. The verses in white room just kill. Um, there's also a cover of Dancing on Air, which uh, I always forget whether these songs precede them, but I think there's a cover of Dancing on Air is from a previous album, um, one of his better ones, one of the better songs on a previous album. Um, but yeah, both these albums, and for some reason, these are the two albums that are no longer in production that you can't find. I couldn't find them on streaming. I, I think you can find them on YouTube. Um, but for some reason, his two, I think, most like vibrant, outstanding albums are the ones you can't find anywhere. Um, uh, this song, on Shadows in the Air in particular, uh, This Angel's a Liar absolutely ridiculous song the bass on that song is insane um yeah the middle part of this album shadows in the air is like over an hour there's two songs in the middle directions and malonga where we almost are getting into this sort of wasty ween kind of brown hazy period but it works really well if you listen to the album in its entirety um windowless rooms is a great bluesy stomper um dark heart has a very sort of Heart of Darkness traveling up a river type vibe only because it's Jack Bruce or maybe not or maybe he's just tapping into some weird energy. It's sunshiny above so you know you're going up into this Heart of Darkness but at the same time the sun's out so it's this weird sort of mix of, of, of emotions. Um, but yeah, but then The White Room which is the penultimate song on here is so good. Um, if the band Mo has not heard this they need to hear this version because it would fit perfectly in their live set. Um, so Shadows in the Air is definitely the stronger album, I think, than More Jack Than God, but they're both fantastic. They're both fun, fresh. Like this is 2001, 2003. This is late period journeyman Jack Bruce. And he is, I don't know what Kip Hanrahan did, Hanrahan did. I don't know if he put something in the water. I don't know if it's just the introduction of the Congo player, uh, who is, happens to be, who is it? Um, Richie Flores. Also, Dr. John plays on this album and Eric Clapton's on this album. Man, Vernon Reed's on this album. Man, he always brings some really good guest musicians. I got to pay more attention to that. I'm not good at, I don't read liner notes. Um, but anyways, yeah, fantastic, man. Really, really good albums. Both of these. If you can find them, get them, man. They're solid albums. But yeah, on to number four. Uh, my number four is his number six, uh, Jet Set Jewel, which was recorded in 78, but didn't, wasn't released till like the 2000s because it was just 
I guess not deemed good or worthy of being released. Fantastic, fantastic album. Um, opens up with The Boy, um, which a lot of this album and a lot of like his late 70s stuff, and this song in particular, there's sort of a, a 70, late 70s Asia, Steely Dan, laid back Eric Clapton vibe, which I think works very much of the era. Uh, but Jack Bruce uses it in a Jack Bruce manner. Uh, opens up with The Boy, which he would redo on Monk Jack. Um, uh, Head in the Sun, the second song, is a really nice laid back sort of, again, that Eric Clapton groove that just works great. Um, Neighbor, Neighbor is kind of a silly song lyrically, but has some really, really great bass playing in it. Um, love the title track. Title track is just has these really kind of a longer, proggier, almost jazzier thing with like these different melodic sections. And the ending of it, there's these background vocals that come in as we get to like the final like lyrics. And it almost has this Roger Waters, like what Roger Waters would eventually do, you know, in like the 80s and 90s and now with his solo stuff, where the background vocals come in and give the ending like this, like I think Go Fishing on Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, where like, we packed our bags and moved or whatever. And it just gives it this like, climatic energy that works fantastic um please up tempo chaotic crazy crazy energy uh right there in uh i guess early side two um mickey the fiddler which he would redo but not really redo because he hadn't released the album yet uh nice cool bass low-key bass driven energy nice little story song by M mickey the fiddler um she's moving on another low-key song that is this awesome sort of rolling piano motif that drops in on a couple of the I think courses um this is one of those songs that gets quiet and then kind of gets upbeat then kind of gets really really quiet then gets upbeat again but there is this piano like lick that repeats itself throughout the song that is just fantastic um and then the the closer the best is still to come kind of a nice slow to upbeat high energy slightly anthemic type closer yeah, it's a really good song from start to finish. It sounds good. The songs are good. The energy's good. Very much tapping into a late 70s, somewhat chill vibe, though there are moments of somewhat a little bit of chaos and high energy and a little bit of aggression seeping in every so often. But a really, really, really good album. Uh, my number four, Jet Set Jewel. Uh, my number three is his fourth album, Out of the Storm. Uh, released in 1974. Um, apparently this was uh, quite a like drug-induced sort of album uh, where there was a lot of, I guess, Bruce was on heroin. Apparently at one point they did like PCP or something and recorded a bunch of stuff and got crazy. The music doesn't really have that sort of chaotic drug element, but there is sort of a, there is sort of a Neil Young Tonight's the Night-esque vibe at times where things are just, you know, I don't know, just feeling a little too druggy, but it works. I think it helps the, the album. I think it, it, it lends itself to a very all a vibe of the album. Um, I, I think there's not as many things on this album that jump out like melodically hook wise as some of his other stuff. Um, but I think the more you, the more I listen to it, the more I just really appreciate what it's offering. Um, some really great songs. The opener, one of his best things. The closer, one of his best things. The opening pieces of mind, the closing time slip, which has this awesome like guitar heavy ending jam to finish off this album that is just as epic as a Jack Bruce guitar jam is gonna come. Um, and then it also contains Keep it down. One of his just mm, keeping it down if it's hanging around. Just like this anthemic, just swagger, swagger of a song. Um, yeah, just just a really enjoyable, like a deep sort of dark horse type listen. Like kind of sandwiched between like the first the first two sort of official albums which are going to be one and two on this list and the follow-up which was house tricks the sort of pop a little bit sheenier like late 70s this is very much a mid 70s kind of like seeped in just drug use and whatever darkness the mid 70s has to offer um Again, not an incredibly dark album, but as far as Jack Bruce stuff goes, there's there's definitely a quiet intensity, intensity about this that the other ones have in more fun spades. This one just has in like darker, darker energies. But yeah, my number three, Out of the Storm. 
Uh, number two is his third Harmony Row, which came out in 1971. And this is kind of has the same vibe as his, the one that's going to be number one on the list, his uh, first officially released, but second recorded. Um, and that it's kind of a little bit of everything. You get maybe some short little piano ballads. You get some longer, like proggier things with some nice instrumental sections. You get some like acoustic stuff. You get some upbeat little fun numbers like this song, do a letter of thanks. So we're doing, you know, things going a little bit hyper. Um, you get the beautiful singing, absolutely like mic drop, beautiful singing on some of these songs. Um, it's just kind of all some like dark, like bass grooves, like that, you know, the, the grooves that Bruce, you know, those bass, like the not funk stuff, but that Bruce version of funk. Yeah, it's just a great journey from start to finish. Like every song is like a, worth checking out. Um, some absolute career highlights. Um, opens up with sort of the short little whimsical, like sort of like, ah, calling out for help, can you follow? The awesome sort of proggy extended escape to the Royal Wood on Ice. You burn the tables on me getting down. Another short one, there's a forest. The beautifully phenomenal sort of mini epic morning story. The beautifully phenomenal folk song. Um, Smiles and Grins, another just really long, awesome epic song uh, that reminds me of... Uh, uh, the very, very beginning of this song reminds me of uh, Peter Gabriel's uh, Lead a Normal Life. There's this neat little like bass motif that kind of pops up um, that re reminds you of that. Then it goes a completely different direction. Um, we got the awesome uh, post-war song. Uh, what is that? Post-war? Post-war. Yeah, kind of about post-war stuff. The high energy letter of thanks. And then two awesome closers, Victoria Sage and the Council at Sunset. Like from start to finish, a fantastic album is Jack Bruce, like being Jack Bruce, like there's a timelessness to this stuff. Not in that they're like timeless classics, but he does seem to be drawing like energy from some other like world and these songs and the way he sings them and just their energy, just, I don't know, just a really, really good special listen. Um, that's right up there with the one that's number one. Like just doesn't quite have the overall diversity as the number one has. But it's a really, really good effort. But now on to what I believe is Jack Bruce's best solo album. And my number one is his second album recorded, his first officially released album. So yeah, apparently it was all downhill from here. Um, Songs for a Taylor. This might be a perfect album. A perfect psych rock pop jazzy experimental album just every song has something interesting to offer it's very eclectic in the way the 60s were incredibly eclectic the eclecticism system works perfectly um absolute bangers on this throughout just an absolutely phenomenal piece of music never tell your mother she she's out of tune amazing up tempo high energy psych pop song with some great bass playing the Theme for an imaginary Western, which I don't even know how to describe this amazing piano ballad that just, the reason I bought this album was because they had theme for an imaginary Western. They had the, I guess it must've been the bass part on Guitar Magazine. They had the bass tab back when I was in like a teen, preteen, I would buy guitar for the bass tab, for the guitar tab. Um, and they had this and I was so intrigued that they would have like this bass part that I had to buy the album. And, fell in love with the album. Uh, Tickets to Waterfalls, just good psych pop. The awesome Weird of Hermiston. Rope Ladder to the Moon, which is straight out of like a Dukes of Stratosphere type thing. The upbeat, funky with horns, Ministry of Bag. He the Richmond. The, I don't even know how to describe Boston Ball Game 1967, but what an awesome slowly building track that just gets crazier and crazier. Two Isengard, which is probably the reason why I associate his music with Middle Earth. Two Isengard, one of those awesome sort of slow ballad numbers that has an absolutely chaotic ending slash middle section where things just go off the rails and then the absolutely fun to clear out to close out the album. Like a perfect journey from start to finish. You get so many different flavors, so many different ideas, so many different instruments, and yet it all works perfectly. Um, yeah. Apparently, I think George Harrison is on this album, on the first song, though he's not credited as being on it. Um, so that's an interesting thing, uh, I guess. 
uh, Jack Bruce and Eric Clapton all hanging out with George Harrison. But yeah, what a great, great, great. Yes, easily. My number one album, Songs for a Tailor. And that's it. That's my ranking of uh, uh, Jack Bruce's studio albums. Um, I would say they're all, they're all good. I mean, none of them are bad. But I would say everything from like, even the top 10, going to Silver Rails, everything from the top in the top 10 is pretty, pretty awesome album. Those bottom four are not bad. They're just inconsistent um, and have highlights, but also have, I'm not even saying low lights, but just things that are kind of forgettable and bland. But yeah, a really, really good solo repertoire. He's got a whole bunch of other stuff that he's done with a whole bunch of other people, including Cream, which I did elsewhere on this channel. Um, and I'll get to those someday. But uh, I've been inspired to do other things based on this so i'm going to do that and then i'll get back to jack bruce at some other point but anyways uh let me know what your favorite albums are let me know which one i shouldn't be sleeping on let me know which one i praise too highly let me know what i should go back and check out um i take these i i, I appreciate these comments it helps me listen to things with fresh ears but that's all i got thank you subscribe like share do anything else but go listen if you have not heard songs for a tailor go listen to that now it might be a perfect album. It, it might be one of those perfect albums in the history of music. It is a fantastic, fantastic piece of work. All right, that's it. I'm done. Peace. Talk to you later.